Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm here as always with Andrew Vance from the Choose the Hard Way podcast. And this is a special, very special episode for two reasons. One, it's a share episode with Choose the Hard Way. So welcome if you're a Choose the Hard Way listener. And two, we have Patrick Bro. He's also known as Lantern Rouge. Probably, I, I would say the most dominant, at least dominant grassroots cycling media personality online. Um, we can get into if you consider yourself to be like the paper of record at this point for for English language cycling media. I think you might be, but this is a huge get for us. It's great to have you, Patrick. Tell us, where are you? you we see you're very sunny. We're very I, jealous. I'm happy to be on. We had a good chat the other day, Spencer. And I thought, you know, we, why not go on the podcast? Because, yeah, we talked about some pretty interesting stuff and we can talk about cycling or media business but yeah i mean i'm on the gold coast that's why it's very 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 bright behind my shoulder <laughs> like there's no blockout blinds in australia like in europe or i'm not sure in america or, or canada if there is so 4 30 a.m you better be getting up in summer because that's when the sun blows through your, your window um so if i start sweating a little bit um just know that i've i've closed all the windows up for the the mic quality so um, i'm putting in the hard yards for this pod well, thanks. It's that's that's a sacrifice that Andrew's gonna respect and respond to. I, I definitely know that. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna make you sweat. We want to see you cry. We want to have laughter. And also, before we kick off, if uh, you're tuning into this on Beyond the Peloton, you probably heard me on there bef- on here before. But if you're not familiar with my podcast, Choose the Hard Way is a podcast about how hard things build stronger humans. And I frequently have guests from the world of cycling, not always I have people from the arts, uh, professional athletes from other disciplines, people from tech, business, venture capital, uh, the world of special operations. And some of the cycling guests I've had on in the past few months include uh, Chris Waugh, who was the, is the chief innovation officer at Sutter Health and famously rode his bike into me uh, to try to wreck me in a cyclocross race back in 2013. I've also had Dr. Kevin Sprouse, the team doctor for EF Education First Easy Post. And I'm going to be having Alexi Vermeulen and his creative collaborator, Avery on in early 2023. Many other guests coming on. And I'm a former Strava executive and journalist, and my byline has appeared in Rolling Stone, the Los Angeles Times, and probably every cycling publication you might have read in the United States and many in Europe. And uh, Patrick, really excited to chat with you today. Have so many questions for you. I'm very curious about some of the things I've seen pop off on Twitter, both related to pro cycling and to what you and Spencer do. Awesome. Can't wait to get into and, it. Well, I think we should start probably by talking about microphones. So don't you, Spencer? <laughs> yeah. So you were right before we recorded, Patrick, he's in Australia right now, but you live in Andorra, uh, I guess, as your main residence. If t- let me know if legally you can't say that, yeah. but for tax purposes. Um, no, no, that's okay. good. Yeah, Andorra is my <laughs> is my main is my fiscal fiscal domicile. Yeah, <laughs> and that so th- that's a big move, obviously, from Australia to Andorra. I assume. Um, I mean, we've spoken about this in the past, just personally, but you did it for lifestyle reasons because it was too difficult to keep covering pro cycling from the Australian time zone. Yeah, so it's like. I had a, a sort of decision matrix of, okay, I, I cannot, if I want to do this full time covering cycling, I cannot do it from Australia. Okay. So where do I have to move? I have to move to Europe or probably where you guys, a lot of you guys, when I say you guys, I mean, people covering cycling in, in North America, in, in Colorado is actually a really good spot time zone wise, tax wise, business wise. Um, so I had really a choice between sort of Texas or Colorado or uh, Europe on, on continental Europe. And I went with Europe, um, over America just because I wanted to be a bit closer to the races. And so if there was travel free, say I have to go to the Tour de France route reveal or anything like that, or just get a coffee with someone, it's a lot harder to do that from, uh, from North America, even though the time zone I think is better in North America to cover cycling in Europe. Uh, and so then it's like going through, okay, French, I speak, okay, French, but is that the best place to set up a digital media business? No, Spain. Is that the best place? It will be in a few years. They're introducing things to incentivize creators or digital creators to go to Spain rather than Andorra, but that wasn't in place at the start of 2021. Ireland, not on continental Europe. 
so Andorra was the the one, especially because if you do, you don't have a Schengen passport, like you guys, I presume, or Australians or South Africans, then it's a lot easier to just go to Andorra. Say I'm, I'm so I don't do the the pros all have residency usually, which is passive residency. Majority do. Some actually now have active residency, but majority they pay fifty grand euros, show their pro contract residency gone bang you got residency i have a different thing which is i had to start an, a business so i have a company and our own company i just submit a business plan to the government and to the banks and you only get residency once the banks the bank opens a bank account for you so the bankers like hold the keys to residency and so once they're happy okay your business plan is legit though and you still gotta you gotta st- stump up some cash too um but yeah that's been the best move because like I'm on the right time zone. It's really like, it's really catered towards for a micro state. Of course, you can't get a lot of things like some things that you might want, but if you want to get any bike paths, you want to get your bike serviced, you want to go hiking, you want to get, okay, your, my Sony camera breaks. I can literally drive down the road 10 minutes, get one duty free in like, he'll have like five in stock sony a7 threes or new eight or sony's or he'll like i'll go in my, my mic's busted or i want a mic for a travel whatever and at the store in like the main street there's like 20 stores that will all have mics and because people come from spain for duty free but also there's a lot of spanish youtubers living there and would you so you have a digital media company would you describe yourself as primarily a, a youtuber you break down bike races on on youtube I think that that was how it started, obviously. And then I've tried to spin it into a broader media company using the YouTube channel as like the engine room for it. Um, you know, so for example, I got rights agreements now. That's great. But what happens if, what happens if they go up 10 X in value? Like, you know, sports rights change a lot. They don't just go up like 5%. They like, they're really variable. What if they go up 10 X? Well, then I need the podcast, which isn't, can, doesn't rely on the rights so much as a hedge and then now I'm doing consultancy work for some teams or a team and then the agent going to get the writer's agent license was another hedge in that like what if the media business sort of falls down a little bit what if there's an advertising apocalypse in 2023 um so I got like that's why I was like I need to have all these different things that are not strictly how popular my content is on YouTube so Patrick a question for you and for Spencer as well when you announced your relationship with Yumbo Visma, quite a bit of activity on Twitter about that and about whether you are a journalist or a creator or what exactly you are. I'm curious how both you and Spencer think of yourselves. I never really thought about it. I'll, I'll let you answer, Spencer. I've already spoken. Well, a just a little bit of background. I, because of actually your uh, co host for Lantern Rouge, Benji, um, you guys do work for Yumbo via Lantern Rouge Media. Um, I think Lotto approached Benji about doing some work. He couldn't do it because he was already occupied and referred them to me, a very nice thing to do. Thank you, Benji. Um, and so I was doing breakdown work, like video breakdown work for Lotto last year. And so it, and so when you announced right after the tour, a great tour for Yumbo that you guys had been working for them, there was like a lot of yeah, a lot of thoughts shared on Twitter. And I'm over here sweating like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. Like, this isn't good. People are gonna be pissed at me. And and Andrew said, (laughs) you were like, what are you worried about? Everyone hates you anyway. You work with Lance Armstrong, like you've nothing to lose. But I thought it was a little ridiculous. Because, you know, it's like the the most egregious example is like Draymond Green is a podcaster, like a media personality in the NBA. And he's employed by a team, the Golden State Warriors, he's actually playing the game like, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a journalist by any stretch of the imagination. W- would you describe yourself as a journalist, Patrick, or are you just more of like a content creator? I didn't really, I haven't really thought too much about the distinction between the two and the, the, the definition of what a journalist is, is going to differ between wherever you are. Um, I'd have to read like the Andorran definition for what actually strictly applies to me. But I think what I would change about that is for sure the, the audience would have liked to, I think a lot of the ones would have liked to have known at the time or in, in advance. And that's something we said, like afterwards, when we got all that feedback, we then, when the dust had settled a few weeks later, we said, okay, this is how we're going to manage it in the future, which is let everyone know this is what's up. We're going to be doing, you know, tell you in advance, okay, we just 
signed X agreement, it's going to last this amount of time, or if this agreement's finished, we had no longer work for that team, just so people know in advance. Um, I think that was the major issue, not the actual, it was just people as well. It's like, could I have probably done the announcement a little bit better on my end? Yeah. <laughs> and the timing. So like, if you're going to announce it, like I did at that point of the Twitter France, it's going to like pop off on Twitter, isn't it? Instead of like a, I don't know, a November, maybe in the off season, I, there was always going to be blowback. Um, but I think the way I did it as well, um, amplified that. Just an observation that I have is that I think many people would like to think that their analysis or commentary about a sport was potentially so insightful that a professional organization, a team would actually pay them to provide those insights to the team. So I don't know what role that played in some of the blowback or the dust up we observed on Twitter. I think something that people are probably curious about, and you may have shared this on Twitter, but it would be great to share it here, which is what exactly do you guys do for these teams? And I'm sure you may be under NDAs, but what can you disclose about the work that you actually do? So like uh, competitor analysis, like people think, just think about it logically. The big DSs of each team, they're sitting in the car. When the fuck are they going to watch yeah, a race? Yeah, exactly. They can't even watch. They can't even watch the race they're in. That's not. That's not even their fault. It's not like a. It's not like a lazy thing or a competency thing. It's just the reality. They're in the car watching on a little mini screen. The, even the race they're in, they're not going to be able to watch it like that well. Let alone their simultaneous races at world tour level all throughout the season. Not just, and when you add in the dot pro races where a lot of world tour teams or relevant riders are competing, they're on simultaneously. How, like, unless you think every DS when October finishes throughout November, they go and watch every dot pro stage and world tour race in full in November, December, which they like people aren't doing, they're not able to watch every race. So Benji and I fortunately are able to do that. We're watching a 12 de Bessege stage three to see, okay, how does Mads Pedersen kick? on a 700 meter 6% ramp can he get over that and you know answer yes he's quite good on that finish we're watching uh, we're watching like a a 21 year old sprinter and a two dog i'm not watching every every race in full but i watch the finish of every single world tour race uh not world tour i watch the finish of every uci race from like one one up i'll watch the last 5 10k's include like even the races i kind of make fun of sometimes i'll actually <laughs> because I'm a degenerate, watch every single finish. Um, and so that has a big advantage because there's not actually that many people watching every every race. And so you'd be like, I know these tendencies. I know what he's good at. This climb's too hard for him. So you can build up like competitive profiles of specific riders that teams are going against. And also like I can build up videos of every single attack a rider has done in their entire career and have that like, on video and be like okay this is what's going to happen in the first like three minutes before he attacks maybe maybe there's no pattern <laughs> then maybe there's nothing and you won't know or maybe this is what he looked like in the in the five minutes before he cracked you can you, you know build up things like that on, on video so i think cycling's almost i'm not a data person like in terms of i'm not a i'm not a computer engineer or anything like that but i still think cycling is incredibly hard to model and so video and watching the races and using your, the computer in your brain can have like huge advantages when most of the competition is not watching every single race or going back and watching every single, watching the race again to see, okay, what went wrong? Yeah. And Spencer, Spencer how do you approach well, just it? Just two things about what Patrick just said there. That this is like a bit mind bending if you start to like think about it too hard, but so Patrick, you keep all the races, right? You record every race. You probably have like a library of every professional race that has happened in the last four years. No, no, not, not, not the last four years. Um, but there's, you're a sport player and GCN player, a GCN plus rather. So like, you don't even need to, they have a repository now where you can just, if you want to, okay, I, I think that happened then you can go and now even they have like a search functionality now. I think GCN plus, so you can like, search up the races makes it a lot easier but if, let's just say um you know time warner i think is their parent company let's say things don't go well i don't know they sell off gcn it gets shut down 
it's like what the heck are we gonna do like oh those races are just gonna go away like unless someone stores it so just doing but that has yeah, happened doing that in itself is a valuable thing for a team because yeah and then the second piece is like you could be a a successful baseball analyst and never watch a game like the funniest part of the Moneyball movie is they're like doing all this work the game starts and billy bean just drives home he's like oh i, I don't watch the games like what are you talking about um but you can't do that with cycling because as you say it's not a math problem it's not as easy to model so you're basically just like a professional watcher of races because we have an odd setup where the coaches are driving cars at the same time they're coaching and as patrick said no one's going to go back and watch race after race after race so you just watch races and and try to find patterns and i even remember there was a discuss discussion during the tour this year where it's like yeah i can get you guys these breakdowns like right after the stage but then they're you know like i don't they were worried they wouldn't even be able to have time to watch it watch like a short breakdown after the stage like that's how busy they are because not only do they have to do the race they have to like move it's be like moving every day you're so nomadic you don't really have time to ever sit down and think about bigger trends during a race as it's happening and I think the – so I presume you're talking about uh, sprint analysis yeah. for Lotto, if I have to guess, because, you know, Lotto is a sprint-focused team. Um, that's also another thing is video. How do you, you – I think you could – I think you – they've done it in horse racing, which is modeling of how the group moves and the drafting benefit. And a horse race over 2,000 meters is extremely similar to a, to a cycling sprint in terms of they're going 60 kph or 40 miles an hour um aero is important drafting is important uh slight differences is that cycling races accelerate at the end rather than decelerate but it's very similar and they have modeled things like that a little bit better i think the mountains would be dif the, the, the difference is of course that like cycling sprints also they're not in a the same course straight line but video is hugely important for sprint analysis like the guys will it's, it's the easiest to show on video did you drop him off at 222 20, 25 meters or 150 because you got the two guys on the bus being like that was a good lead out or you know now you dropped me off too early well you gotta go look at the tape to say okay no you you left him ideally you don't want a guy doing more than 10 seconds in the wind after he's been let out more than 10 seconds probably gonna get beaten and like morkov was dropping cav off last year doing four seconds yeah, <laughs> like you can't lose like a total of 15 seconds <laughs> 2021 20, tour. you can't lose from that position um but yeah some guys are getting dropped off like 18 seconds and like you got no chance against unless you're like there's a huge ability discrepancy which if the tour there isn't everyone's good so yeah a video is hugely important but as you said uh spencer like it's more important i think almost for the coaches because the riders like they're so tired. Imagine that they just had a bad experience, didn't go to plan, and then they go on the bus, and then the next morning, or whatever, they go, the video is up, and here's what you did wrong. Here's what you, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It, ideally, you have a team culture where it's a positive, constructive, this is what we're going to improve. But still, like first thing in the morning, you know, this is what we're going to change. I think it's better to have it like the coaches actually see what happened, and then they are are equipped to communicate better with the riders. This is what you guys need to change rather than forcing the riders to sit there mid grand tour and watch through it. That's just my view on it. Patrick, follow-up question. You mentioned how difficult it is to model what might potentially happen in a bike race, which means that it's difficult to have pattern recognition. Yet I think what you just described is a great example of a pattern you have recognized, which is, Hey, if you can, put your sprinter in the position where they're only in the wind for four seconds, they're going to have to do less work. They're in a better position to accelerate more rapidly and to win the race prior to you and people like you and Spencer are getting involved. Were those types of facts, were they understood and were they being leveraged as precisely as they perhaps are now, or is this a new innovation? I think the key is what you said just at the end of that question, which is, were they leveraged precisely? And I think no, but always, of course, for 30 years since the traditional sprint train was set up, you know, three decades ago, they knew drop sprinter off late, sprinter will win. Like it's not like they understood that, of course, but did they know, okay, 10 seconds is like a tipping point where 
if you have to do more than 10 seconds, you've got real problems. And seven seconds, he has like X percentage chance of winning or a much higher percentage chance of winning. No, like I don't think that's well understood. Um, I think I think all the teams are trying to get their sprinter let out as close to the line as possible, but there's no like goal. And especially when meet, meters are irrelevant because as I said, like there's curves, uphill, downhill. So like, Again, teams teams are smart. Like they got they do have experience. DS. They're not like oh, it's a it's a false slide uphill finish, so we can still drop him off at 175 meters. They know you got to drop him off closer, but it's like okay, but you got to calculate the time it will take because the speed will be like maybe 52 kph. You know, at the time you need to actually drop him off. Where will 10 seconds be? Okay, it's going to be at 110 meters. So that's our goal. Yeah, you only know the and time you- after it's too late. So yeah, you have to try to figure that out. Exactly. That's just, but that's guesswork. Yeah. yeah you're just guessing like, and it's hard, especially because climbing, you can guess we, like, we're really, really accurate on the predictions of the, especially on the steeper the climb and the longer, the better for like accuracy. But yeah, sprinting is, you know, you're really guessing. Are you guys situated within the team, within the context of a full stack high performance team, or is what you're doing complementary to what the team is doing? internally from a data analysis of performance data point of view um oh like i i'm not like logged into their to the team's training peaks or anything like that i don't i don't have like access in that way um it's more it's tough it's sort of yes and no i think this year was more of a trial and then the next couple of years i think it'll be integrated a little bit more um but yeah, I'm not like, no, I'm not working like full time for, for Yumbo. Um, and we, we didn't work full time for them this year either. It's more like, okay, there's this specific race. What's your thoughts on this? And we kind of did more than was expected, I think, in terms of what we provided. So it's more the case that you are, are providing an input that the team then chooses what to do with yep. versus like, I've had the opportunity to work with the high performance team for world rugby and some professional sports organizations in the United States. And typically that's going to have perhaps psychologists who specialize in skill acquisition, people who specialize in biomechanics, skill transfer, and then you're going to have a strength and conditioning coach and then an actual position coach working with specific players. And then there also is going to be somebody looking at data um, from video capture and replay. So, but in this instance, it sounds like it's, not as aggregate or there's not as coordinated of an approach yet within professional cycling. I think that's right. But the essence of what you said is correct. Like we provide an input advice as consultants. This is what we think about race strategy. This is what we think the competitors will do. This is what we think you should do. They can take the advice, take it on board, do it or not. Like, for example, people thought we knew exactly what Yumbo would do every stage. Like if you listen to the podcast throughout the tour, that you couldn't couldn't be further from the truth. Like I thought, you know, they may, maybe do X, they do this, and there's reasons for that. Like I'm, we're not embedded in the team, so there could be a myriad of reasons why they would be like, "Thanks for your advice," but for the X, Y, Z reason, actually, it's better to do this. Or for example, I like I thought they were going to lead out well on the Champs Elysees, and then I was like, "Where's Wout in the sprint?" And they were doing the victory. I had no idea they're going to do the victory victory dance and not compete for the sprint. Um, on stage 21 but yeah it's it's like provide advice on this thing and then of course yeah there's like the trainer um as well like the performance guys who are really really good like are like actually maybe this guy's like you know not feeling so good today i don't i don't know i don't really i don't see that data i'm not I, as i said i'm not looking at like their physiological stuff unless i need to sort of post race and that's new in itself i mean yumbo is like the best team as far as front office, back room stuff, I think. Um, But, you know, think even, you know, I don't know, seven years ago, like teams would not have coaches or you you would just provide your own coach. Like if you're on a professional team, you hire an outside coach that's been brought in house mainly because it's, you know, easier to control naughtiness when it comes to doping, if you're doing it in house, but also like, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here, but like Vodders used to coach the riders himself. Like he, he would have like six riders that he was like personally coaching. 
on EF. Like that's insane to me. The man is like, you should be coached by like a doctor or like a professional, someone who is only doing that. Um, I think the results were rather mixed with Jonathan's personal coaching of team riders, but you know, we're like just now entering even the dark ages in cycling, but also I think you'd be surprised in like the NFL, especially how bad some of the, the inter intra team training is like the Cincinnati Bengals don't have a training facility that's indoors because it's just cheaper not to have it. And I have a friend that consults for NFL teams on, you know, the type of player you want to draft. And he went to one and asked like, so what's your, how do you guys keep an eye on every player's um, metrics, like biometrics? And they're like, yeah, we weigh him once a week. And like, this is an NFL team that's playing today or not, no, not literally today, but is currently competing in the NFL. And they're only just weighing players once a week. And that's how they tell if they're in shape or out of shape or what they need to work on. So th there's a lot to be advanced in, uh, in professional sports. I actually think cycling's ahead of the curve in like performance culture, uh, not in race strategy and all. And that is like a separate bucket, but in like getting guys to go as fast as they can for their genetics. I think cycling is actually, that's where all the focus has been rather than on getting the best results for a guy's physiology through better race selection tactics, et cetera. But like the average, the 10th guy in a grand tour now is going faster than the winners 10 years ago. And there's more testing. So like they're the before, like they're doing four altitude camps a year minimum, like even teams who historically maybe, you know, like tactics wise is FDJ the best? No. Do they have a really good head of performance? Yes. Like their guys are all performing at a really high level. They even improved like the Lapierre did a, like improved the TT bike for them. So like all the teams are trying to go faster now, even historically the teams that were a bit slower to it, you know, and maybe Sky were the, the leaders, like all the teams are going fast now. Yeah. And in professional cycling, we've been gathering data on athletes from a, from a power point of view, which provides a more granular level of understanding of the athlete's performance, of course, than heart rate alone since the early nineties. So cycling has been one of the most data-driven sports from an individual athlete point of view for almost three decades now. And from a team point of view, it sounds like a data-driven strategic team performance is a relatively new thing. And there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in that regard. Yeah, I think it's still, it's still really tough to predict what the top guys will do on a mountaintop finish in their A target because there's such few data points. Like how often before the tour, like how often did Enric Mas do a 45-minute climb to altitude in good condition where he's motivated to go full gas with good pacing in a race? It's maybe like once. And so he might have improved loads. It's really hard to accurately guess what everyone will do. Like, I thought Renko would go super fast in the Vuelta. Like, I thought he would, but there was a range. Um, like, for sure, I thought there is zero chance he gets dropped in the first week. Zero chance. But I, I didn't know he would take 90 seconds on stage six. I was like, what the fuck? Like, him and Jay Vine went super fast. Um, so even, you know, that was really surprising. I thought Pico Hanna would be group sprint, but then two guys just really perform at a super high level above what I thought. Um, and so like, it is still tough to predict. Yeah. And think about your Craig Lewis profile. Fantastic, by the way, for outside magazine in 2006. Thank um, you. And it was all just about, you know, it's like, he's the next Lance because his power to weight numbers are at a certain level. And like, that's been the obsession in cycling for over a decade now that you know it's just like as patrick saying bleed everything out of someone's genetics because you have to hit you know 6.2 watts per kilos for 50 minutes to be competitive and then what's been neglected is the basic strategic structure of, on how to actually race to maximize that fitness and you know and gain an edge in ways that aren't just training and physiology it seems like another area where there could be further optimization, and I'm just thinking about 
Tom Dumoulin, Jonas Vinigo, and some of the other athletes who have maximized their genetic potential and then really suffered from a mental health point of view is taking a different approach to mental health for these athletes to ensure that once they reach that level, they can actually continue to perform at that level. I think Grant Thomas is a great, a great example of like, and Kwiatkowski, I think Kwiatkowski and they sure to take like a, at least six weeks, like properly off. Thomas has had a, in terms of physiology, a career year this year, at, what is he? 36 years old. Um, like he's had a really, he's, he's still going to be in your probably yeah, best GC contender crazy. next year. And him and Roe, they seem to, you know, fuck around a bit and they don't take it too... Like, of course, they take the race super seriously, but they're not like... They're clearly like... You look at the Instagram stories or whatever, like they're having fun on the December camp, you know, they're keeping it light. And if I had to guess, I don't think Grant Thomas right now is like hyper-stressing that he's 100 grams over this weight or whatever, like, because that's not sustainable. Um, He knows, okay, I've got to be ready for the Giro in May. And... He'll lock in in the two months before that. But obviously, he's still training and stuff. But I think that's for long careers, that's sustainable. Now, maybe, maybe if you want to hit like the high highs, that's you can't do that because it's so competitive. Maybe, maybe you need to for Dumoulin to win that Giro against Quintana, who was still performing at a high level when he's what, like a foot taller than him. Maybe, maybe if he'd taken the Thomas approach, he wouldn't have been able to have not that 0.1 watts per kilo extra and he gets dropped too much on the climbs. Yeah, I, I completely agree that to be at the level, I mean, Tom Dumont's a big guy, naturally a big guy to be racing at the weight he was racing at is just probably going to fundamentally take a mental toll that is perhaps unavoidable. I don't know if there's like a clean answer there. If there's a way to walk that thin of a line that he was walking and then preserve your mental health or quality of life i'm kind of interested in like valverde i mean if you watch that movie star documentary the guy is unbelievably lean like him and um mark soler are like sucking in their stomachs to see who's the skinniest and valverde yeah. looks like a corpse almost it's it's really shocking <laughs> yeah, scary it doesn't seem to it just seems like he's able to always be at 100 and it never really takes a toll and he was able to do it for what 22 years or something I don't, maybe that's just an inherent mindset that not everyone has. I think he's kind of similar to Thomas a little bit, a little bit different, but like having, now that I speak a bit better Spanish, like I can actually understand that, you know, I can listen to watch their documentaries or watch their YouTube content, which isn't subtitled. And like Valverde, who's retired, is doing the full December training camp right now with the team. And like, he's flogging them on climbs too. Like apparently the guy's saying he's like pushing on the climbs. And I think he would come back from a race and he would just go train with his buddies. And I'm talking like accountants and whatever. They just go do a, a flat group ride in Mercia, just chilling. Like I think he ha- he's like the old school, I train, I get fit through racing and I'll just like tootle around at, at home Um in Mercia and and then I'll, I'll sharpen up for the big A targets. And I think he just loves it as well. I, and I also think like scary thought, if he's going to actually be a DS, but you can tell from that, you see in the documentaries, like he doesn't really, he doesn't really think about the, the yeah. race too much. Like he's not sitting there obsessing or before the stage, like stressing out. Oh my God, am I going to get dropped on this climb? Where's the pinch point of this? He's just like, oh, I'll go race today. I think that helps his longevity. That might be, yeah, I think those those kinds of instincts, I think, are going to serve him well when he enters the gravel community here in the next three to six months. Imagine Valverde turning up to, <laughs> to <laughs> it's like 60 kilos. He'd, yeah, he'd be good. There's like a, he, I reckon he'll do the gravel race Classico Hayen in, um, in January or February down in Spain. And then he'll be like, actually, maybe I like gravel. And then Canyon. Can you be like, actually, would you like to be a sponsored gravel <laughs> athlete? Man, we can only dream. <laughs> and then uh, this is who we're, that's our competition at the BWR ride, Andrew, when we go do that in the fall. Yeah, he'll like, it'll be him. <laughs> it'll be Sagan, probably Remco. I'm going to go ahead and make, I, I like hot takes. I'll, I'll make one, uh, I'll make a prediction right now. I think Valverde, gravel world champion 2023 possible sagan's actually realistic i reckon they might actually when, when is that what month is it in 
September, right? Post, post Tour de France. Yeah. I reckon there's actually a high chance specialized to like, do you want to do that? That would be, oh, that'd be awesome. And I think now that you say that, Patrick, about his training, that remote, like when I was just coming up, you know, as like a low, 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 low level professional, um, it was, yeah, you train to get in race and you like do, you just kind of do a lot of group rides in your, you know, in your training. And then maybe 2012, 2013, the sky model of every training effort needs to be a simulation of a race or you should never yeah. turn a pedal if it's not relevant to this training plan. And everyone started training by themselves and group rides kind of hit a low point, you know, and, and that's probably effective, but it's not good for your longevity or your mental health at all. Like if you want to be, have a long career at a high level, that's probably not the best way to do it. Guys are trying to ride like they're training in races now. They're literally like, oh, I don't want to go above this because my yeah. threshold X is like, even though they know they're not going to get dropped, they're trying to like, and it, even if like it puts them in a way worse position. Um, so like a lot of the young guys are just super obsessed with the power numbers to the point where in races, they're like race. Like if you're doing a full gas mountaintop finish, of course you shouldn't just like launch it from the base and blow yourself up. But like you might with in that high adrenaline, high stimulus where you've peaked for it environment, the 20 minute best you might've done before is completely irrelevant. Like you, you might exceed that. Um, so yeah. And often like guys, oh, this guy's doing so much power, psych themselves out. Like I think, yeah, the, the power numbers are a little bit, of course, when you have a race plan, okay. Penultimate climb, want guys to go on the front, do 5.5 between 5.4, 5.6. That's different. But yeah, uh, the power stuff, almost gets overrated a little bit over like actual race dynamics. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Do you want to, I have Andrew and I ask each other questions on this podcast from time to time. And it, I'm very excited to have a new voice here. I'd love to lob a few at you if you're ready to take them. Go All for right. it. And I'm, I'm not a journalist. Andrew is a journalist. So mine are easy softballs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so why why is it this is something we've discussed on and off the air a lot why is Remco Evenepoel not going to the Tour de France in 2023 like what's going on here that's the Giro seems like a step back to the Volta in my opinion if you're world champion you've got to be at the Tour that's my it, that's my unwritten rule about the sport like yeah. at some point you've just got to step up to the plate and do this he's not that much younger than Pogacar I don't really buy this he needs to develop line of thinking what do you, what's your answer here what do you think I think there's a few reasons that they are, that are flawed. First of all is what you said is that they think, okay, slowly, slowly, you know, Vuelta, then Giro, then we'll step up to the Tour de France, which is like, I'm not even sure that is a thing. Like people say, like say that's yeah. a thing, but like Pagacha went Vuelta tour, even though he wanted to go to the Giro in 2020 and the team made him do the tour and he wouldn't, and then he would never have won the tour in 2020. Um, yeah. So there's like, okay, we need another stepping stone. When you're the world champ and you're like, let's say what, clear top five GC contender in the world, I think better than that. But let's say a clear top five, if you just won the world to like that, yeah, like why do you need to do another stepping stone? So I think that's flawed. Second one is they think the team's not good enough, but I think it's better to learn, like see where the team's not good enough. Do Are the rulers good enough? Is it the mountain train that's a problem? Because like, it will the race will show where your problems are and i think if you win a soft giro or it might not tell you that information of what extra rider you need and then thirdly is impossible to know but could be attendance money at the giro like he lives in valencia he's moved there there's the volta of valenciana around his house like a five-day race in the start of february and yet he's doing the vuelta of san juan at the end of january flying to South America, to Argentina, to do that race, which is like sketchy too. Like you should see some of the finishes in that race. It's like, well, <laughs> why is he doing the Vuelta San Juan? Like um, it's not a better race than Valenciana. So I think, yeah, they're trying to <laughs> maximize those world championship stripes. And I hope, I hope they spin it into a top, some top domestiques in 2024, because that must be the reason why they're doing this is for, 
to think they build up the team and get some more money. I don't know. But yeah, I, I don't think they think he can win the tour is another reason. They don't think he can win it. They don't even know how good he is. Uh, yeah, I, I think the stepping stone is a foul. It's a fallacy. And I think Tom Dumoulin, I mean, he didn't throw away his career. I mean, he had a great career. I would have loved to have Tom Dumoulin's career. But he didn't win the tour, I think, because he faffed about so much. And I mean, do you remember he had this like, obsession with not going to the tour? Like, oh, I'm going to the zero because there's time trial kilometers. And then actually never really worked out for him that well, except for the one that he won. And then he lost to Froome and he got second and then went to the tour and got second, which is he got fourth at Worlds. It's like the worst slash best result run I've ever seen. But if he just goes to the tour that year, I think that was what, 2018, he probably wins the tour. And then yeah, it's maybe a different career trajectory. So I think that's a huge mistake to just think that you have these stepping stones. And if you remember Bradley Wiggins and what was that, 2013, the zero is not a slam dunk. Like you can get roughed up at that race. Exactly. Like that's the other thing. They think, probably think, oh, okay, Giro, he'll walk it. But it's like, if he doesn't win it, that's going to be yeah. tough mentally. And then they think, oh, he'll just, he's young. He'll just win the tour. It's like, will he? Like, you, let's say it's just all probabilistic, right? If you're a top three GC contender in the world like him, you're going to have, let's say, a five to seven year peak. Every Tour de France you enter, you have a 33% chance of winning. Like, that means there is a, a world in which if you only do it three times, you probably, well, I'm trying to do that in my head, but like you will win one 50% of the time. Like, yeah. that's not a great that's not a great odds. Like you should every year when you haven't won it and it's your life goal. If it is, I don't know what his life goals are career goal. Then when you're in peak condition, which will not last forever. Like you got to do the tour. I think like how long was most guys peaks and not that, you know, five to seven years. Lance was different. Lance, I think almost had a, a an eight to nine year peak, but even he, when he took the time off, I remember on, if you look on 53.12, Ferrari's website, deep in the forums, <laughs> one of his responses is that Lance was physically at his best when he took the time off, but mentally he needed to take the time off. So whatever way, whether physically or mentally, it is tough to have more than five years straight at the top. Yeah, I I, do you, I agree, agree. Go ahead, Andrew. Do you believe that Remco strikes me as a very confident person do you believe that he has been convinced that he does not have the ability to win the tour or do you think he himself does not believe he can win the tour i mean may maybe he just wants to win the giro maybe he just thinks he's got unfinished business with the race from 2021 is that last year when they rushed him back yep. to do it um it's kind of funny how like on the one hand they've rushed him back to do the giro after the horrific accident and then a year later we're meant to believe oh it's like a slowly slowly like career progress thing like seems very two ends of the spectrum uh, no i think he you're right i think he he would know surely he can take it to to pagacha and vingegaard and roglic like he would he i think he he's confident he knows how good he is like he rode away from everyone at worlds and liege and beat Roglic. I know Roglic maybe wasn't in top shape in the world to be still, he destroyed everyone in that first 10 days and the race was over. Um, even when he crashed. So I think he knows like, he knows numbers too. Like Remco also, like he knows power numbers and what's peculiar. He knows what he did in the world to in Norway. He can compare that. And I'm not, he doesn't think, Oh, I'm just going to go ruin them in the tour de France. But I think he knows he'd be competitive and who knows, maybe, maybe I used so in 2024 is like way better than all these guys. Maybe Jan Oterbrooks in 2025 is way better than everyone. And maybe Jorgen Nordhagen in 2026 and seven is way better than everybody. Like Bernal was one in 2019. It's not yeah. that long ago. And so, you know, he's, he's unlikely to win a tour ever again. Is he on the right team? Does he need to leave quick step? Oh, nah, like probably any else were interested. Um, I think quick step is fine. Like equipment is good. Rulers are good. Alaphilippe is a really good versatile domestique. Like as we saw on the Vuelta before he crashed out. Yeah. And here's, I, I think quick step, I think the team itself is fine. The equipment's good. And 
they generally they're really good at probably managing tricky stages too because of all the sprint experience they'll like their directors will know okay this is a pinch point this go this way around the roundabout not this way they'll be really like well above average in that so i think quick step's fine um is he getting underpaid yes like lefebvre i think wrote an article literally almost boasting about that two weeks ago saying yeah if remco left quick step he'd be the highest pay- paid rider in cycling but he's here with me <laughs> i was like i'm not sure you should write that <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah i i think the team and is fine i think it gives him maybe in the off it'd be a little bit more but you, it'd be a big change too you mentioned bernal i had him on my list of questions why do you believe that he's never going to win the tour now oh because he wasn't he wasn't doing it even before the crash like you look at Tirreno Adriatico, uh, 21, like he and Thomas tried to one, two Pogaccia and they just got, they got ruined. I mean, okay. He's, he might not have been in peak shape, of course. Um, but his numbers pre crash su- suggest that he wouldn't really be competitive with Pogaccia and Vingard in the mountains. And so if he's not competitive in the mountains and then we added in a time trial, then it's, it's really, really unlikely. He, his strength is like, really tricky technical finishes he's really good in the bunch for such a small guy crosswinds he's good wet weather is really good cold conditions he's good high altitude like really like in not so that all set suggests yeah giro. it could be like a so five times giro so if he wanted to yeah so he could beat remco in the giro remco could slap him four stages in a row 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds on sort of medium to medium difficulty mountaintop finishes. But then there could be like one brutal stage, you know, cold freezing. And you see what Simon Yates, they could just collapse. Like you don't know how you, and Bernal, I don't think collapses in those situations. And what you're saying, like you said, the you didn't say this verbatim, but you said it like the risk is the ones you don't see. It's like the youth coming up when Bernal's winning in 2019 they're looking around saying, wow, who can stop us? Uh, I Neil Rogers tweets every time someone wins, this guy's going to win for the next 10 years. It never <laughs> happens. But no one knew who Taddy Pogacar was. Maybe if you watched the Tour of California that year, you, you knew who he was, but no one was paying attention. And then he's an order of magnitude better than Bernal. And then, yeah, as you're saying, is Juan Ayuso just going to be a step above everyone? And if you don't strike while the iron hot, is hot, you might never win again. Yeah, like you, you don't know, like because teams now are not doing some sort of like plan where they okay, you're only going to do your first tour at 24, and then you're only going to be leader at 27. Like maybe was the case in 2000. It's like teams know, okay, the, the kid can do <laughs> in training seven watts per kilo for 20 minutes. He's good in race. He's going to the tour. That's what UA did with Pagacha in 2020. Um, like Aru was supposed to be the leader, but they're like, we better take Pog because he's he is so good, um, and who knows? And so teams are not sh- a lot of teams are just not shielding the young guys anymore. If they- like Bora, if I think Bora should take Ota Brooks to the tour this year, along because probably expected case, he's a domestique for Hindley. That's great experience. You'll be in the last 12 to 15 guys on mountaintop finishes. You experience the stress, the atmosphere, and you got no pressure. He'll have no pressure if he goes. I think it's like, well, it's what he needs to do with Bernal in 2018. Yeah. It's, it's the perfect, but maybe they won't. Maybe they're like, oh, he should do like, you know, a dot pro. So sort of, he should try and win Tour of Turkey sort of approach. But yeah, I think Ineos, definitely, they just, if the guy's good enough, bang, he's in. What do you, why, do you, why has this changed? Assuming, let's say Bora does take him, you know, that would, there's, there's a pattern of behavior where it's changed from, yeah, you're a leader when you're 27 to you're 20 and you're pretty good. And the, we have a cancer scientist as our trainer and he's saying, you're awesome. So we should take you. Like, what changed? Why are teams now doing this when they didn't used to do it? Even, you know, power has been a long, around for a long time. And even with those power numbers in 2013, it's hard to imagine a team behaving that way. I think it is the power stuff. I think teams understanding power data and projecting it is probably um, 
probably only the last five years, teams really start to understand it. And like, okay, this guy did X in training camp in January. Because once they put the guy on the on the schedule, which gets decided in December, January, if Hector Brooks, say they have an opinion of him in December, January, that he's not going to the tour because slowly, slowly. And then he does really good numbers in a race in April. Like unless the schedule really allows it, or they thought there might be a chance he goes to the tour, he might already be not able to do the the training camp or his race schedule doesn't line up with the tour because they didn't think he would go in, in December, January um, because they didn't think, okay, like what is Pidcock doing? Six point, whatever it is, 6.6 in December mean he can do in July. Like, obviously it means he should go to the tour. And of course he will go to the tour. Like, of course, but it's the edge cases where it's like, what if he did 6.2 and he's this age and he wasn't that trained? Um, then maybe 10 years ago wouldn't put him in the tour, sort of the tour trajectory where he might go. And will Tom Pickock win a grand tour? I'm asking this one for Andrew. <laughs> it was on my <laughs> list of questions. Thank you, Spencer. Um, it's real. It's really hard. Like he has a he has a chance to, but. Like, is his climbing going to be better than the top guys? Probably not. Um, I have no idea what his fatigue resistance is like. He was really good in the first 10 stages of the tour. Um, will he focus on it exclusively for three years when he's still young and with to the exclusion of CX? Because remember, like, Evans and Fulsang and Rasmussen and Sagan, they were all, they were all like top mountain bike riders. Like they were superstars in others, but they gave it away um, to focus on Rose. So will he, is that necessary? I don't know. Like I'm not a sports scientist. So maybe it's not necessary. Maybe CX is actually good for him in January. Um, mentally, maybe it's really good for him. And, and that's important too. His descending's great. Punch is good. Ineos, obviously above average team. Will he go to, I think he might be able to win of Welter. I think of Welter really, because he's kind of like Roglic, right? Um, I think a, a Vuelta where Pog, maybe 2024 Vuelta, I think is a really good chance he could win it. Guys, a question for both of you, just as we're talking about these individual riders and their prospects for the future, something that often gets overlooked or taken for granted is there's an assumption that the level teams are at today. And like, even if we hold their financial support constant. There's an assumption that's generally made that they will continue to be as organized, as strategic, and will take as cohesive of an approach as they have in the past. And I think last year, and Aos is a good example of, I mean, Garen Thomas shows up with a vest at the tour, right? And the, the first time trial, and like, we just see these little mistakes. And there were a number of those little mistakes that were very out of character, I think, for that team. Are there any teams that are sleepers in the background that you see slowly laying the foundation that might not be obvious to the casual fan of the sport or even the expert fan that are on the rise and might be able to put writers in a position where the team and the writer can punch above their weight. I think Movistar are, are maybe a coach or a DS away, a few changes. Um, now they might go the other direction, put Valverde in the car and it might not work yeah, out. I don't but like I think that situation. I th yeah, I, I probably won't, but I think they're, they're kind of close. Like they, they do, they got good team camaraderie. It's just missing that little little bit. And, and what you're talking about, Andrew, is exactly what happened with Intermarche, which completely went under the radar. I completely overlooked it because no one uh, really looks at staff movements that closely or quantifies them. But yeah, we were doing the Intermarche and DSM preview in the same uh, in the same recording on the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, and we realized, Benji looked it up, that Eicher Wiesbeek went from DSM in the end of 2020, so for the 2021 season, to Intermarche for 2021. And DSM Sunweb, for the four years or whatever he was there, 18, 19, 20, absolutely flying, goes to Intermarche. I think our preview, I was like the, one of the worst teams in cycling. He goes there, and all of a sudden this year they're like, a really good team not just they they got out of the relegation battle by like march and then they were focused on like being a good team um 
And so it, it almost is like one staff member can change everything. Like, um, and Ineos, for example, like a fair few staff movements this year. We'll see what happens with that. Like Narvin, a lot of people I think will let go. Stannard comes in from Trinity. I did like that he went and they didn't just give him a job as a DS at Ineos. He went and worked at Trinity. I think that's good. Um, but yeah, like I don't know how that will play out because it's I have I have no idea how good Ian Stannard is at preparing a group of guys for a race. And so one thing that makes I just think about Mo, I find myself thinking about Movistar more than I should. Like so, they're you know fantastically dressed, you know GM owner seems to do everything there. Like does is that is a hindrance at a certain point because you have this powerful legacy figure just sitting on top of every decision that gets made, and even if Pachi Vila comes in, he can't turn the culture around because we have to go on the sensations and how we feel versus what objective things are telling us. Yeah. I, th- I think, I think in, in Zue senior is really conservative. So like if, if a decision in a race in the Vuelta means that there is 1% less chance that Enric must keep second, I'm not even to go to just keep second, i.e. a rider going for a stage from a breakaway, then they won't do it if he's calling the shots, that's what I think. And maybe they, cause like when Verona does get a free leash, he like won, he won Do- Dauphiné yeah, stage. Yeah, really impressively um, too. Like, yeah, he's a super strong rider. Like he could be a great rider in breaks. Um, they, they generally only put riders in breakaways defensively as a satellite rider. So they'll put a ruler in, in a, in a breakaway in a mountain stage. And you're like, why the, why have they put Nelson Oliveira in this break? And it's sort of, to have him up the road in case, you know, in case, in case. Um, so I, I'd like to see them be a lot more aggressive next year because they, they can win more races just by, you know, I think if Jumbo Visma let Wafanart do whatever he wants, no, that's not true. Ride for his own ambitions in the Tour de France for green whilst going for yellow, then really if your rider is sort of sitting comfortably in third on GC, the other riders within reason should have some free reign to target breakaways and stages. Otherwise, cause if you don't and you don't have a sprinter, how, how are you going to win any races throughout the year? Like you're not going to win very many races. Slightly important. It's not something you want to overlook. <laughs> yeah. They seem to do sometimes. <laughs> do you think exactly. any of Andrew, I'll let you ask a question right after this. Sorry. I'm, I'm going crazy over here. Do you think any is, I mean, obviously the death of Nico Portal was tragic and unforeseeable. I think he was like a great man and manager and they haven't quite been the same since. But do you think Dave Brailsford stepping back, stepping up to his kind of C-suite corner office role has hurt the day-to-day operations of that team? I don't know. Like, I, I'm not in the team, so I have no idea. But yeah, like it's... Yeah, Brailsley's gone. He's going to. He's like living in what, like a camper van in Nice, right? Managing the football team. Yeah, there. and he used um, to. Ellingworth came go across to every. I think every race, like he would just have a little camper van that he would yeah. be, right, drive around to every race they were at. And then, sort of, they had a couple of years during the pandemic. Yeah, they like they hired Adam Yates. Was he the answer? Like no. So like they let him go. They they still have a lot of like quite good, but not like s tier gc contenders and maybe they're like okay well we got to sign michael leonard because i said nordhagen what if michael leonard 2026 2027 is the one at the tour uh they signed plap he's kind of in the great thomas model yeah, like an x-track guy but i i don't know it's it's ellingworth's in charge their some of their signings like i think are quite sponsor driven like viviani is he like, why do they sign Viviani? Like that, that's for the Olympics, yeah. right? That's not really for road. And so they even have a whole of sport objective, not just road performance. And I'm always just assessing on road performance, but that, cause I'm like, Viviani is not good. Like he won, I think uh, he's not good at world tour level anymore. So Ineos is a, one of the top teams. They should only be focusing on world tour wins or young guys who could win at world tour. So why are they signing Viviani? Well, friends with Ghana and it's, to get gold on the track in Paris in 2024. And I'm like, well, 
if that means Pinarello pay more money, like, can I criticize that? Like, that's just, it's just reality of business. You mentioned Brailsford. Something that struck me during the 2022 season is that during the few bright spots that Ineos did have, I'm thinking of Perry Roubaix in particular, like it seemed like Brailsford himself actually won Perry Roubaix. He really put himself in the foreground. I know Spencer and I talked about it following the race and he's clearly like he's played a huge role in British cycling and in the success of Sky and then Ineos. It just seemed odd to me that he was popping up during the uh the like very bright spot highlight moments um for the team in a way that you didn't really see with other organizations but um it's something we haven't talked about that patrick i'd love to hear your take and spencer as well what's going to happen to matthew vanderpool in 2022 or sorry i think we know what's <laughs> happening in 2022 he might be winning a it's few more time, races this yeah. week but as we yeah yeah, yeah as christmas races as we look to 2023 though is this going to be – are we going to see him just completely flame out at some point, or do you think he's going to actually manage his talent and his effort better in 23? I think they've brought in some really good support for him with Sir and Krar and um, Quinton Herman, so that's a big plus. Um, I, I don't know. Like – it's kind of crazy this year how he did what classic Milan San Remo classics, Giro tour. Um, and I, I don't know what happened, but in the Giro, I think as well, like there's no shame in leaving after the first rest day, if you've achieved your objective. And if it's, if staying is going to stuff up the rest of your season, then, and, and you know, you need to go to the tour for sponsors and whatever, then what ended up happening was he didn't leave the Giro and then he had to leave the tour on stage 11, um, which wasn't a great outcome for them probably. So I don't know. It's a lot of weight on him. Maybe then Quinton Hermans, they think can take some weight off in certain races. Maybe he doesn't have to do some of the other races. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's that's a risk I agree that like, I'm always thinking uh, what could happen here. He's had the long standing back. Back, chronic back yeah. issue i think um th that wasn't actually from the olympics fall it was like I, I think from memory it was separate to that um so i don't know i think he'll still he'll still turn up to rvv as the favorite like if sir and cry and hermans is there like he should still be the favorite i honestly i worry about um just looking at some of the conditions they've been racing in during the cyclocross season, which are the same conditions they always race in, just the risk of an orthopedic injury or re-injuring his back seems extremely high to me. And I guess he's a rider at a level and on a team where he can have significant control over what he does and does not do. It just does not seem wise with other objectives he might have later in the season for him to be running in ankle deep mud on off camber turns but you know he's a well, fighter well, there's not he much money out there yeah so so, so they, they they can't tell him no because he's only on two mil and like he's worth four five um if he was on another team um as sort of one of the best classics riders in the world and everything else he does and he's on two and i think that's <laughs> so then he has to be able to go all the CX races with all the appearance fees, etc. So yeah, is it the same with Pedcock then? Oh, I don't know what he's like. He, he signed a big extension with Ineos, but I think I think part of that that's okay just to negotiate. I think, but surely that's sort of their whole of cycling thing. So I think like they're happy for him to do mountain bike at the Olympics to do cyclocross because it's like Pinarello gets three three bikes worth of exposure rather than one and you know, multi-sport and the, the Olympics, let's be real, the Olympics is bigger than 99.9% of cycling races. So it kind of makes sense. Yeah. I know Spencer and I did an episode about cyclocross recently and it was immediately, I'm going to forget which world cup race it was, but it was the one where Matthew Vanderpool was leading, slid out on the cobbles, had a, a very heavy wreck. And then Pitcock was inches behind him, ran into Vanderpool and then also went down on the cobbles and I mean, I think that's just a perfect example of, yes, wrecks happen all the time in cycling. We all, on, beyond the Peloton, we always talk about how the ground is undefeated 
in the uh, history of bike racing. Like you're not going to win if the ground decides you're going to be stuck to it. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, like, gosh, does Pidcock want to take that level of risk with what he has in front of him? I guess the answer right now is yes, but. It's why we're nerds and he's him. <laughs> we are like, yeah, you're he's right. not sitting around thinking, yeah. oh, is this actually that safe? Should I be doing this? Um, but yeah. even like the back end of this year, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I have thought of, a lot about that, Patrick, where he Vanderpool spent a lot of time in mountain breakaways, which like they were impressive. Like, that was cool. But oh, super exciting. not what I would recommend. <laughs> I think it fried him for the rest of the year. It's is he just kind of making his, he's a bit essentially taking a pay cut so he can be his own boss. He can work for himself. Um, yeah. Like what can they say to him? You yeah. know, like he's, he's brought that team up um, and he's been there for ages. So, but yeah, it's like, do they know? Like exactly. Those mountain stages were super impressive. And I was like, wow, he's actually performing better than I thought he would, but he still couldn't win. Like, like on the final, like Mount Top finish, I can't remember it was like Jan Hirt or someone. Like, it, I swear it was like Jan Hirt, Carthy, Buitrago, and um, Lamb Riser were like in the break, like three consecutive mountain breaks. And like they still dropped him on the final finish. And he didn't really have a chance. Um, but I don't know, like maybe it was the appearance fee at the Giro. Um, and so, like, you got to finish the race. But yeah, I guess you can sit in the bunch too. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Um, it's it certainly didn't help his Tour de France preparation, like finishing the Giro like that. No, I uh, guys, I, I regret to inform you, I've got to run. I've got basketball tickets. I got a tea time coming up, Andrew. He's got a he's got a tea time. He's got to get to the golf yeah, course. But, uh, do you have one more question you want to ask, Andrew? Uh, just on that Matthew Vanderpool topic, one of the things Spencer and I talked about during the Giro and then during the Tour, and you mentioned this earlier, Patrick, this phenomenon of some riders within Grand Tours or the highest level races, they it seems like perhaps they're just training in the middle of the race. Did you get the feeling that Vanderpool was potentially doing training as the Giro went on, or was it just unintelligent, non-strategic riding? Oh, no. He definitely was training in uh, Settimana, the one-week Italian race before the Giro, 100%. That was just like training. Um, no, in the Giro, I, I think he was trying to win the stage. I think he was trying to be like, if I, I reckon I can win. And there was a chance he could win one of them. Like he tried to get ahead of the break using the descent and stuff. Um, I think he just wanted to put on a show and see if he could win a mountain break and, and test his limits. And like, yeah, it was super exciting. But there was, I can't remember how the Tour de France started. I didn't really have any stage that suited him in stage one, two, three, but yeah, like then. Oh wait, do you, yeah, this is, this is <laughs> fitting because it was in I Denmark. Remember. I don't think there was a single hill the entire opening. Weekend. No, but he was there, right. For long way in Lausanne. Yeah. And he, he just. The st stage six and eight, those punchers. Yeah, stages? he was terrible. He was always like last guy in the bunch could barely kind of stay in the race. Yeah. Yeah. So like those are his stages. Like he probably pog won one, right? I'd say he probably beats, uh, he, he wins one of those two, I think. Cause even Wout, the one Wout one wasn't perfect positioning. He, he sort of had to come around Matthews. So I think Van Der Poel wins one of them in peak condition. Spencer, how about you? Have you got a final question uh, I, before you head I'm out to the team? Does he know that some races are more important than the others? Because do you remember the Bink Bank tour was like the day before Liège and he was off the front for like 50K? And then I think he finished seventh at Liège the next day. And it's like, you probably win that race if you just skip the final day of the Bink Bank tour or don't go solo for the last two hours of it. I think in race, Van der Poel actually took a big step up this year. I think he was way better in race. So like in those Giro stages in a bubble, did he to win those stages with that parkour, did he adopt a strategy that gave him the highest chance of winning? Yes. Was that the good idea with the Tour de France coming up? No, probably not. Um, but like, yeah, compared to two years ago, and he said this, he's like, I don't do dumb attacks anymore. You don't know how long your career can be. I've got to make the most of it. I think he is much more economical in races now. Like Tour of Flanders, he wasn't trying to flex yeah, yeah, exactly. on anybody at any point. He just followed Pog. 
and then worked a little bit 50 50 he wasn't trying to like be the big man or whatever or, or, or drop him at any point and then he just completely finessed him in the final like backed himself like he played that strategically perfectly when he wasn't the strongest on Quarmon. uh he wasn't even the strongest guy in the race it, well he was had the best sprint which is super important um, but yeah, on Quarmont, Pog was stronger. So I think in race, his strategy has improved a lot. Okay, one more. I understand there are certain loyalties within this group. People are getting paid, whatever. Who's going to win the Cyclocross World Championship? <laughs> who's who's competing in it? Is it Wow? Are the big three doing it? I heard Wow. Yes. Doing it. Well, they skip yeah. It. I mean, actually, I don't know. I don't know if Wow's committed <laughs> I heard he's yet or if it. he's going to be at, a, a at, an, at an altitude camp. I don't know. All right. I'm going to go with Wout if he's doing it. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with him. Okay, Spencer. I, I would love to say Wout. I once like <laughs> suggested Wout might be good at cyclocross uh, but in the days before injury, and I got like 55 Instagram DMs from the cyclocross boys telling me I was an idiot and d- don't know ball because Vanderpool's better. But I think... <laughs> I actually have no idea about cyclocross. I have no <laughs> this idea. Is, these I, are dangerous you gave me three waters, options. <laughs> I think Pickcock. I don't know. I, I like this. I think he's the new okay. kid on the block. I think the old guys are. He's good on the punchier courses, right? And they're good on like the heavy sand courses, the bigger boys. Yeah. I think that's why he probably dominated it. Where is Worlds this year? That would be a, my next question. Do you know, Andrew? If it's on a beach, I'm going with Vanderpool <laughs> or Wout. <laughs> uh boy spencer you've caught me with uh yeah i actually I, I can't remember i don't know i'm still i'll tell you what though i'm gonna go with matthew vanderpool i think that he's aggrieved because of the incident at road worlds for which he has now been exonerated apparently and i think he wants the rainbow stripes the most out of those three athletes even though they're all you know, if they're all game writers, they all are fighters, they all want to win worlds, but I think it means the most to Vanderpool, and I think he will fight the hardest for it, unless he crashes on the cobbles again or injures his lower back, which is totally possible. Then I have one more question. One more. Who, who's going to win the tour in 2023? Tour in 2023. I w- if Ayuso was doing it, that would be my hot take, but he's doing the world. That is a hot take. But he's doing the welter, so I can't even say it. But I think, he, yeah, he would be lethal. Um, my like super hot take is Enric Mas, just because I'm also like a bit of a mob star. Like I really like the teams that aren't perfect. Um, like Mas is, it's never been a better time for him. Um, no high altitude, no TT, but I still have to go with with Vingegaard. Yeah, I think Vingegaard will win. Um, Roglic, the recovery, like. I don't know what, what what's happening with him, but yeah, I'm going with Jonas just because I think there are some, of course, there's no Col du Granol, but there's some really steep climbs and and it's there's much more climbing than this year's race. It's just spread out a bit more evenly. Um, and I don't know where, I still worry about UAE's like ability to control the starter stages. I'm not sure they fixed that problem. They re- Like if they got Stefan Kung, I would have been like, okay, that's like, Kung and Trentin, that's really powerful uh, at the start. But and Kung can climb too. He came like fifth in Tour de Swiss, so he'll he'll like help you after some of the big climbs in the flat. But um, they didn't, so I'll go with Vingegaard. Stefan Kung got top five at every race in 2022. It's a little known fact. <laughs> There's not a yeah, race on the much. calendar that he was not close to the podium. Andrew, who do you think? Andrew's not he a. He came top ten in that Paris stage, the stage eight that. Simon Yates won. Was cr- he like, he yeah, he's crazy. He's like the best rider no one ever talks about. Andrew, you don't believe in Jonas, do you? Do you think he's you? You actually said a hot take one time that he was never even going to race the tour again. Yeah, I don't believe he'll race the tour this year. Okay, that's a big. Hot, that's a hot take. <laughs> Is molten lava? <laughs> I yeah, that's an interesting. Actually, that's an interesting perspective that. Jonas is the favorite for 2023. Now you kind of have me doubting my Pogacar. Pog will be the favorite, I think, in the betting markets. Yeah, favorite amongst. The... Do you think? No, yeah. Do you reckon? Pog will be the favorite for sure. Um, okay. I just meant internally, our favorites in our hearts. The, yeah, the most yeah. important place in professional cycling. Um, it's impossible to note. Like one of them might crash yeah, in Paris Nice. And then exactly. it's just, exactly. you know, it, it's really important because, like, you know better, like, you see Jonas on Jonas on Solaison, 
in Dauphiné, you're like, okay, well, he's not crashing. Dauphiné, he's tuned up. He's looking good. Then you know how good the guy's going. Pog at Slovenia, kind of, it's harder to tell. But yeah, like, who knows? Like, so much can happen in six, seven months. I know that's the boring, the boring opinion. But yeah, like, so much can happen. It's do you, also, sub question to that question. Um, I, I got into a mini argument with Benji saying, you know, his theory is that if Pog doesn't win the tour every season, a season is a disappointment if he does not win the Tour de France. You know, even he could win Flanders, Lombardia, World Championships, three stages of the tour. Like, do you think it's tour or bust? Tour overall or bust for Pog in 2023? I think for Ineos Yumbo and, and UAE, yeah. Every year. You spend that much money on a team, that's the goal. And if, you, you know, you, your goal is to win the tour. And... I know it's very reductive and of course there's other races, but like if you're really thinking like a high performance, like the goal is to win the tour. We have to win the tour. If you don't win it. Yeah. It's like, you can call it a bust or a failure or you didn't meet your objective, whatever you want. But like, yeah, I, for those three teams, that should be the goal every year um, with the money they're spending compared to the other teams or the talent they have. Tere Pagachar, I regret to inform you. You're a failure this season. Well, it's oh, like... I think, did we lose? Oh, we, Patrick's here. I thought we lost you. Well, it's like maybe maybe they also did everything right to put themselves in the best position that year. You know, did Ineos, could Ineos have done any better this year in the tour? Probably yes. not. No. 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 Really? no. That was as good as... It. <laughs> that was an amazing ride from Parent uh, Thomas. Alpe d'Huez stage with Lepidcock and Thomas third. Like, it's pretty good. I think it's pretty – I think from an outcome point of view, you're correct. From a process point of view, I think they absolutely could have executed better at the tour. Would the result have been different in the end? No, but I think that it revealed fractures in the team that are disturbing. Well, that's why Yates was gone, right? Yeah. I'm not saying it was a bad team or anything, but it just they, they figured it didn't work. Whatever yeah. that dynamic was, it just it right. didn't work. So it, they were happy to let him go. But Carapaz is third place the year before – papered over similar problems you know, that didn't work you had thomas that was much yeah. worse so yeah you might be right yeah. Andrew. there's a there's a pattern here that's all i'm saying yeah yeah well they yeah. i they're kind of like yeah. a forest that it's it's not burning so the undergrowth is keeping new trees from growing and it's like all these pretty good riders you talk about but not the best best are keeping riders from Luke Platt from developing into true leaders because they have like too many middle managers, basically. They used to call it the Death Star. I think we're maybe one step away from seeing a rap video come out of their team camp. I think that they might join some that of these other teams that are dropping rap videos. <laughs> dark to think about. Damn. I love um, rap. I love hip hop, but I mean, I'm not sure that we need an AOS uh, rap video. We might see that, one though. That's the death spiral. But yeah, it's like, okay, once Thomas and Rowe retire and Criado maybe like, oh, that Criado signed through 25. But yeah, like, who's the leader? I guess someone else steps up. But yeah, they got Sivakov out of contract, Gegenhardt out of contract as well. It's a lot of these guys like, do you, do you even want to give them the tour opportunities? Because like Gegenhardt with no TT at the tour, like, do you want to give them the opportunities if they leave or, you know, it's, yeah. I, I, I think the best you know they they're doing what they can with all the chips in the table with peacock i think that makes sense they tried to get remco i think or at least thought about it answer was no um so i don't really see what they could have done too differently this off season um i i think them letting carapaz and um what's that scene from moneyball when jonah hill's in the car park is like I think it's a good thing Johnny yeah. Dam is off your books. Like I think I think that was a good thing not to to match their salaries, Carapaz and Yates, because they're not they're not winning the tour for you. So I also have one more question. So I I wake you up from a six month slumber. You fall asleep in August. You wake up in January, and I say Mark Cavendish is on Astana. Yeah. Do you believe me? Do you think something has gone wrong? No, for sure I believe you. Yeah, because. Cav doesn't really care about the record. Cav cares about the record as much in as much as it gets him a nice contract. I think yeah. <laughs> like if he really cared about the record, wouldn't there have been other better options that he would have already signed with? Like, um, cause like 
I kept saying Ineos makes sense, but then I was like, why would no that you you're forgetting Ellingworth signed him at Bahrain McLaren and that was a disaster. So like that's not happening again. Um and I was like, okay, so that's off like if he if he took two hundred K, some other team would have signed him with a better lead out. But of course he he didn't he obviously wanted more money, which he's entitled to. Um but it you know he wasn't, I don't think his primary focus was go to best place to break the record. Cause why would you go to BNB in the first place? Like, why did you, why would you decide that in August? Yeah. So you think it's just a keep cash and checks phase of the career? Yep. I hope the checks clear might be, that might be <laughs> a problem at Astana. Well, that's the risk, yeah. I mean, they got Lopez money now off the books, so they can presumably he got he gets a fair chunk of Lopez yeah. money or more. I don't know, but I mean, they got uh, they got Case Bowl and and Sirietsa as lead out. Like, it's not there is someone to lead him out. There is there are humans to lead him out who are big, um, but it's also like that team's never gone before a stage with a strategy of how to do a lead out for a pure bunch sprint in a world tour race, let alone the tour de France. So like, there's no, there's no Tom Steele's, uh, a quick step or ballerini. Um, no, not ballerini, but Ramati in the car. Who's going to map out exactly how it's going to play out and it's going to be correct. So the Cav's going to have to do that. Cav's going to have to coach. I think the team on how we're going to play these stages, which probably a good thing actually like he's you hear him talk about stages afterwards like he he knows what he's doing but that's a lot of responsibility for him and i don't know if yeah it's going to be i think he has a chance but it's also the equipment too like he's he gone from spesh with all that to to their equipment that's a bit a downgrade too patrick did you feel like it was a bit of a tell that cavendish might be headed to astana when he started spending time with former Astana rider and DS, Lance Armstrong and Johan Brunel. Nah, I think that was just, that was just a catch up. I think. Two, two guys know, with he's... great, fantastic relationships with the Astana team. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was just a catch up. I, do I, I, I didn't even thought of that. Um, that, but that was pre Lopez. So unless like Vino had some like plan that he knew they were going to fire Lopez and that would open up Cav, and he started talks with Cav before firing Lopez. So he only fired Lopez when he knew Cav might come. Maybe, maybe <laughs> it was like all that happening, but no, I don't think so. I think it was like Lopez got fired, and then he's like BNB folded because BNB might not have folded at that point either. So Cav might not have been available. Although if his agent was doing his job, he would have been talking to other teams. I don't know. Um, but I think more likely it was just reactive. Everyone's just reacting to things really last minute. Fair enough. I have to point out that to engineer the joke slash conspiracy theory that I just advanced, once I learned that Cav had signed with Astana, I had to go to Google because something in my brain was like, I think Lance wrote for Astana and I, I'd totally forgotten. And he in fact did in 2009, which uh, that was I don't think. My, tour. Yeah, that I don't was think the, I'll, that was the great yeah. one. It was a great, was I'll a great never tour. Forget, yeah, Lance coming back, like, <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Wait, what's Astana? <laughs> like, what is what, what is going on right now? <laughs> I remember, I don't know if Contador would only take bid-ons or gels from, like, one guy on the team um, during that tour. There's so many, so many great stories from that tour. Um, and, and, like, I, I'm on neither rider's side. It's like, when Conrad got dropped in the crosswind stage, the stage Cavendish won incidentally on, I think, HTC. Um, it's like too fucking bad. Like Lance made the split. A lot of GC guys, including you, didn't. Too bad. Like make the split um, if you have co-leaders. And simultaneously in the mountains, if Lance can't follow when Conrad wants to gain time on it was Schlecks or someone, too bad. That's racing. So it was, yeah, it was great to watch. Like I, I've rewatched a fair few of those stages recently. That's it. Yeah, I've got that one on DVD. Now, that, that that's not going anywhere. That's the best. Um, this plug and put the DVD. sliding doors moment. <laughs> I always think about with that is so what Lance misses the yellow jersey by like oh a fraction of a second in the team time trial. If he gets yellow, does Condor? I, I guess the the boring answer is Condor still, still attacks, attacks, but it like you could imagine yeah. like maybe he can't attack and. He's this way better rider, but he can't attack his teammate and Lance wins that tour. 
So I think Contador, bef- Lance got signed after like late, right? Or for that season, I think when he came back, it was unsure if he was coming back. So I think Contador had been promised to a leadership from what I understand. So I think he wouldn't give a fuck. He'd just attack him. Now, whether there would literally have been like an on-bike bust up, maybe, <laughs> um, or post-race, but I think Contador still attacks him. It's kind of like the Alpe d'Huez stage that um, who's your man that won? Sastra, when he attacked Schleck in yellow, yeah. not attacked. That was their plan <laughs> to, to work Evans over. Schleck talk. Yeah. Shout out um, Schlecks. <laughs> that was great tactics, but like tough for Schleck. Because he, yeah. he probably still would have won the tour if they just rode, if Sastra just went on the front and rode tempo. But they were more likely to win the tour the way they, the way they did it. And then that stage is incidentally why Armstrong came back in 2009 because he couldn't stand this is off the record everybody forget you heard this but he couldn't stand that Sastra won the tour because he didn't consider him a very good rider he's kind of a pure climber and Edge had a, had a great day on Alpe d'Huez but yeah it's it's great strategy like I've watched that stage in full as well the way the way they set it up with can, the way the Cancellara the way Cancellara worked um as well as like a ruler in the mountains, really impressive um, the way they played that stage. And this it's co-leadership. Like has it ever for like multiple years been like a harmonious? No. Like, you know, it's, it's tough, like managing co-leadership. Um, Cause Sastra kind of like got run was... off that team a little bit. Is that, or he left to go to Cervelo. Yeah. yeah. After yeah. winning the tour. I don't, I know. I don't know if he got run off, but he left. Um, and it's like the same thing, like from Wiggins and Thomas, and Thomas is, I, that's why I love G. Um, he's really has no ego. Like he will Dauphiné let Port go last year. Catalonia let Yates go. He's not a guy that's like, I'm going to gain more in the TT. We ride Skytrain for me. I'm still going to win most likely. Like he's really embraced co-leadership with so many different riders and it's really impressive i'm going to throw something out there right now because this discussion is giving me an idea i'm wondering if listeners would like to hear some kind of version of the rewatchables where we take a look at a classic stage maybe get some of the writers or a writer who was an animator of that stage on the show and talk about it if you think that would be cool hit me on twitter at vance at v-o-n-t-z you can hit spencer at BTP cycling or Patrick at oh I think it's at Lantern Rouge YT that's for YouTube um now we so, have to do it because you said it now yeah. it's out there we have no choice I think I think that so would be I, fun yeah I'm trying I'm trying to hit up ASO to be like how much would it cost for me to put up the full Col de Grenon stage on YouTube with like me doing a full con like the four and a half hours because I think it would be It'd be super popular. Like they you should, have to they should pay you, man. Yeah, well, that's a separate. That's a separate. Yeah, they should <laughs> be paying you. I yeah, I, we probably can't get into this. <laughs> I had like a whole section on the ASO in here, but maybe that's an uh, offline discussion. Can you say- I, I have a good relationship with them. I I think they actually get a bit of a bad rap. Um, like. And listen, I'm not. I pay them. Are you on the pay- payroll, Patrick? No, I'm paying. I'm paying them. Is there anything you want to disclose, man? I'm paying them a lot of money. Is what I want to disclose. But I, I, I have a good business relationship with them, and they're pretty. They're one of the better people I've worked with in the cycling industry. But yeah, I like. Is there a nice market? Like, look at NFL. Didn't they put out that Minnesota game? I said it on the poll the other day. The Minnesota, the crazy comeback where the score changed like six times. It was like maybe a month ago. The NFL put up at least the last quarter on in full. Yeah, they'll they'll just just put put it up up. in full because they figured. Yeah, and they put Super Bowls up too. And they're 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 premium product. They will put the full Super Bowl on YouTube. And if they're doing it, like there are some smart people working at NFL. Like you know, (laughs) that's with American sports. Don't second guess what the best sports leagues are doing in the media space. If they're growing their asset value to like ridiculous amounts of money, they're doing something right. They know what they're doing. Just copy it. Well, I think they correctly deduce that it's like milk, right? It spoils so fast. Like once the Super Bowl has happened, the the value yeah. is decreased to a point where they don't mind giving it away for free. Same thing with 
you know, if you were doing what you're doing with the NBA, you wouldn't have to pay them anything. You could just use as much of the game feed as you want. I know it is. It is all, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a whole other like podcast is talking about like media rights, the structure of the business, like how it works. But yeah, like I look at John boy, not paying, he doesn't pay a dime no. for rights, right? No. And I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like millions of investment based on just like using as much like of a premium top four in F- American sport for free. <laughs> um, now maybe for full stage reviews that, that doesn't, that argument doesn't hold up. He just takes interesting snippets. Maybe if he was doing full stage highlights, he would have to pay. I don't know, but yeah, it's a whole different world over there. Well, you're welcome anytime. I'll I'll talk to. I was right by the White House the other day, actually. I'll talk to Joe. I'll get it worked out so you can come over and live here if you want. Maybe, maybe yeah. I'll set up and start a start an NBA or NFL or because like my channel, I kind of based on Coach Daniel, and he ended up working for the Dallas Mavericks. He did NBA analysis on YouTube, and then he actually just gave it all away because his end goal was to get an analyst job. Um, uh, I think he's given it away. So yeah, I just was like kind of copied his format and the dunked on format. Wasn't your Twitter bio like maybe someday I'll stop watching cycling and you guys can screw off or something like am i misremembering this <laughs> yeah well like maybe i'll get bored i don't know like it's possible like you never know i've changed changed industries really rapidly maybe maybe i'll get bored i, I mean i'm working for yumbo through 2024 so at least until then i'm locked into cycling um and also the the aso agreement runs for a fair while too so for the, for now, locked into cycling, but maybe yeah, maybe maybe cricket uh, in the future. Yeah, we didn't get into this, but I uh, did a bit of research: basketball and cricket coaching certifications. I noticed, Patrick. Yeah, I was a I was a basketball and cricket coach for like throughout the entirety of university for like six years, five six years, um, and even coaching some like decent cricket teams too. Um, so cricket's also like cycling in that it's kind of if you don't understand if you didn't grow up with it it's kind of impervious um and it's can be pretty boring and it's really long so a lot of similarities there um and yeah i I really enjoyed coaching so that's why the yumbo visma work is kind of it's really nice to do that sort of work actually working with a team in a high performance environment as opposed to always just sort of commenting on a race it's it's nice to feel part of like a broad a broader team Instead of like turning Yumbo Visma into a powerhouse and the best team today, would you like your boss, Richard Pluge, was just like a, a cycling media guy and he bought that team probably for not very much money. Like, would you ever think about just buying the BNB license and then Lantern Rouge Media is the sponsor of the team? Too much admin, too much work. Like, I, yeah, I just, I don't have the, I don't want to manage that many people sponsorships like you're doing like a lot of his job is sales, yeah. right? Like uh, I'm not interested in it. I would, my dream, my dream in like four years is to, um, <laughs> is to run, like run Mother Stars, like race strategy. maybe, um, <laughs> or, or FDJ. Like imagine if you were the person that helped FDJ, like win the tour de France. Um, maybe maybe i'd become popular in france um but yeah like maybe that's a challenge is more of an integrated role as opposed to being a consultant but um for now it's like i get the best of both worlds in that i don't have to do any of the bs of like i don't have to hand out a bid on i don't have to like i don't have to manage anything or whatever i don't have to fill in paperwork i just like watch races provide advice um in in different ways and and yeah hopefully it's helpful so uh, it's kind of a good spot yeah spencer i know they're not going to hold those courtside seats forever but patrick i have to ask a follow-up question i know you probably can't disclose specifics about the impact of your work with yumbo but have there been moments when you provided input changes have been made and you've been able to see a measurable difference in the outcome um few things benji suggested in the classics yeah probably um he's benji's stronger than me i think maybe in like in in analyzing classics parkour um there are a few things 
and in stage races, maybe a couple of things. It's hard because it's like it's a process, right? Like we're not – you're not deciding race strategy the day before – like the day before generally or the day of for the tour. It's like it's months of preparation. So it's months of like getting together, talking through things. and um, But, yeah, like a, a few things maybe. Um, but also some other things where I said X, they did Y. Y ended up being way better many times that happened too which was humbling um as well so yeah there are a couple of things uh i think um particularly in in sprints but yeah it's 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 fun but it's at the end of the day they they decide what what strategy they're going to do um or how they're going to play it who they're going to select who they're going to sign i just have my view on it which I guess that's the benefit of like I've always on the podcast or whatever not been shy of saying my opinion, even if I don't have all the information. I try to say my opinion based on the available information, and um, I think that's been good because yeah, if you if you don't try to ever say anything critical or offend anyone, then in in a team environment that's not that's not helpful. If you if if you're a consultant and they're like, oh, how do we do? And you're like, oh, everyone, you know, good job today, unlucky. Like that's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to be a little bit critical. Okay, Patrick, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if anyone in the Boulder amateur cycling community has attempted to engage you to provide analysis <laughs> or direction for some of the events out at the Valmont Bike Park or any of the other uh, <laughs> action that's happening at that level. Apart from Spencer, um, no, no, not too many people. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah Patrick's no, no, doing no, a deep no. dive on the <laughs> bus stop group ride tactics, so I'm like better prepared <laughs> yeah. in 2023. I'm excited about the results. Perfect. It's awesome. funny because like amateurs are probably more likely to tell me, I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> or be like, you, you don't know, you don't understand this. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, but no, it's a lot of people hit me up on, on Instagram more like, how can I go to world tour? How can I get to world tour? A lot of young guys, I try to be helpful with that, which is like, you know, it depends on what country you're in, what, what your, financial situation is what languages you speak it, it really there is no one format like if you speak fluent french and you got a schengen passport then you go to and you're young you go to one of those amateur french teams and if you perform you will get picked up by a french world tour team like they will pick you up so that's easy and then if you're in that's north america easy. australia it's yeah. a lot <laughs> easy. well no it can be no. <laughs> compared to being yeah. in north america or in australia like then you, it's a lot of tougher road yeah, no, I agree. Speak, yeah, you want to speak French, Schengen passport. I assume that's, you know, like Matteo Jorgensen. I would love, how did he end up on, on Movistar? I assume he just spoke Spanish from a young age, or maybe he just jumped in that team and learned nah, Spanish. No, I don't reckon. Not all the guys that are not Spanish speak Spanish that well on that team. Um, I think Matteo speaks, he, he speaks good Spanish now. Um, I, I don't know. I have to look through his results. I think he did well in Lavenir, maybe. But the stuff for some reason in 2020 someone decided to start signing six foot three people with scandinavian <laughs> names seriously norsgaard jorgensen holman and johan jacobs they're not all scandinavian but like they all just decided to sign all these same writers it's like but mateo is really good um i'm excited to see what he can do this actually comes from your part of the world uh matt white I don't know if he pioneered this. He's the first person I heard to talk about it, talk about it publicly, but they would build their teams. Bike exchange would build their grand tour teams around the height of the domestiques. So the idea was you get a, a short Yates behind like four, six, three guys. Sounds simple, right? Cause they're breaking more wind for you, but I didn't hear anyone ever mention this before Matt White did. I know about that. I think you've seen it. Saw so the the bike change with Nathan Van Hooydonk and Jonas in the, the Roubaix stage of the Tour de France. That sometimes you might want the guys to be the same size. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, high, I I think about that for sprints, for for climbs. I don't know about that. I guess um, the for sprints is really important. Yeah, it'd be like, you know, the especially at the Giro. I think the Giro is ninety percent. You're just riding around on a flat road or that's the way it's been the last few years and then if you're not doing any if you're just totally protected then you're stronger on the climbs when the big boys have been dropped yeah but like 
yeah, I think that that's kind of, I'm not sure there's a much benefit when you're cruising around 150 watts. Like if the guy's 6'2 or 5'10, like I don't really see that. Um, I think it, it, it may be as important in the final, but yeah, like for example, Jonathan Milan, I think will be, could be a super lead out because he's like 6'4, 85 kilos, aggressive, like built like a, a truck. So like it's a huge pocket behind him, like Roger Kluger. And it's sort of someone like Richese is that really unusual, someone five foot nine who can have a long career as a last man. How big is Markov? I guess he's Danish, so I assume he's tall. About six, six foot. foot. Yeah. About six foot, maybe six one. But he's big too. He's like eighty two kilos, like big ass, like there's he provides a good pocket. Um, same with Laporte. He's huge. Patrick, have you ever heard anyone on the sports science side talk about the importance of a rider's shoulder to hip ratio for their aerodynamics? Uh, oh, I'm sure like Bigham knows all about that for like TTs. For road stages, that's the thing because like is someone going to put like a 150,000 salary rider who does second last man in the lead out in a wind tunnel? Probably not. Um, maybe they are. Um, but yeah, for lead outs, I'm not sure it's that well understood. The difference that a, even if he's skinny and he's only 77 kilos, but he's like super wide, like Danny Van Poppel, again, brick shit house and the best last man this year. Like, I think there, there's obviously, there must be something there. Like there must be. Um, whereas like, when Remco does lead outs, it looks like he's doing a good job, but it, but is he? Cause like maybe he's putting the guys behind it. He's the other end of the spectrum from a yeah, right. fan popple, right? Maybe he's just actually putting everyone in the bin, including his own teammates. I mean, sometimes they're getting gapped off of his wheel. I mean, I guess if he's so aerodynamic, it stands yeah. to reason he gapped Lampard that the wind is, he has no draft. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I, that's why I look at someone like Milan. I'm like, you're never going to be a top tier sprinter but you have all the characteristics of a, a, a really good lead out. Traditionally, a team will try and make you a top tier sprinter for the next five years. It won't work out like Case Bowl. He's now 28. Um, how about you skip that phase and you lean into being a classics rider, a top tier last man. You can work on your, like if he leaves Bahrain, his prologue should be good on a TT bike. Um, and he might have a more fulfilling career than coming sixth and seventh in sprints. Man, yeah, we're gonna have to do another podcast. That that's all <laughs> pretty interesting stuff you just touched on, particularly Bahrain. Bahrain's. Slow I want to do an American. I want to do an American podcast. I talk about like what's well, Quinn Simmons gonna do? Where's Jorgensen gonna go? Is he gonna read? Like, there's a whole the whole American podcast we talked about because it's like a pretty exciting time um, for the young guys. Will we see human powered health at the tour? Will Scott McGill be on a podium? Nah, they're not going. If Scott McGill gets no the shot. tour, he might win the whole thing. <laughs> if the guy anything's gets a possible, pro professional nutritionist, <laughs> he might be the best rider in the world. <laughs> anything's possible, but yeah, I think you know X might beat them out. Yeah, yeah, I think you're. I, that's a team I'm actually really excited to see at the tour. If yeah. as long as I hope I don't get kicked out of the country for saying that, but I would love to see Uno X at the tour. <laughs> Human Powered Health might get the Giro. I think that's really a decent chance. But because Lotto turned it down, if you know X don't get it, then maybe they might. Oh, Nabi Badiani, Israel. Israel will stump up cash that Human Powered Health won't have. I don't know. And the Giro will just straight up accept cash. Uh, the Giro, this is another podcast, like, is not doing well. <laughs> like, the tour is starting their race in 2024 in Italy. It's like, well, that's kind of step. That was, that was announced today, yeah, right? Stepping yeah. on the Giro a little bit. Like, when you watch this Giro, it's pretty brutal. It feels like it's still COVID. Like there's just like no one on the sides of the roads. It's really depressing. It's pretty brutal. If you're RCS seeing like premium cities, like what is it? Florence, Bologna, Turin. Mm -hmm. Cities with money and they're paying ASO to bring the tour there for three stages. That hurts. It's tough. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Actually can't. I'm sure it's happened. But in the modern era, I don't think I've seen a grand depart in a kind of step on another grand tours toes like that it's kind of a power play from aso the only the only ones like the, the tour starting in the Basque country this year but that's kind of it's but the Basque country it's a little bit different it's not like starting in madrid yeah. you know but they own 
developed that too. So it's like brother, sister, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is a big play. Like, uh, I wonder, uh, maybe then you might have some spicy quotes about it. And then I can't wait. Yeah. I'm never going to get to this game, but 2024 tour ends in a time trial. Are you guys excited about that? Not excited about that. Do you like the last stage in Paris? I mean, it already kind of has ended in a time trial for the last few years, yeah. right? It's just like, then there's just the Champs-Élysées stage and then you go home. Now, now you just go home instead of watching a sprint another day. It'd be cool to see it in Nice. Um, I hope it's not too sketchy because they had that stage one that Christoph won in 2020 was in Nice. It rained and that was a disaster. They can't control the weather, obviously, but yeah, I think it's quite a hard TT. Don't they go up? I think they have a decent... It's hard to have extended flat in Nice. Yeah, I think it's... If you go anywhere off the coast, right? Yeah, I don't. It's I think it's like Monaco to Nice, maybe, and it's not along the coast, so it must be really hard. Yeah, they'll they'll do they'll do some decent like six percent climbs, five. I reckon there'll be a five k, six percent climb in it, maybe six k, seven percent even. So that that'll be tough. But yeah, I don't because they go the Grand Depart in Italy goes to Turin, and then the next city along is like Nice. So like, where will they go? But they're finishing in Nice. So will they like loop up? I presume to the Alps in like stage five because you can't it wouldn't make sense to go up to alsace lorraine where they always go and then go back down to the alps maybe they will i don't know but that's a little bit weird it's the least watchable way to end a race and going back to your point patrick about how american professional sports and others like f1 i think do a great job of foregrounding the media side of what they're doing i think that the worst decision you could make for ending a grand tour is to have it be a time trial. I think the on a prime time, well, actually, prime time Sunday. Yeah, actually, I would say that's the second worst way you could have it end. The worst way you could have it end is have a time trial in which riders switch I love bikes. That. I, I totally disagree. With you it's there. it's, I, I you know like if we if if the drive to survive Tour de France series succeeds, which I think it will, gets more people into the sport, and they then get stuck with this bike change in a time trial in 2024 they're leaving i i think we're going to see some churn with those fans i mean the giro tt is there's gonna be some funny bike changes in the giro tt this year the one is 4k is 15 percent like in that tt maybe people will start on road bikes honestly like <laughs> um and then the tour de france tt that's like there's going to be a lot of work going into figuring out that one because there's like multiple extended long steep climbs, but none are like not one super long one. And then there's flat in between and some descents. So it's like really tough to know the, like we might see some real shithousery in the tour this year. I think if they don't have a designated change point, I think it's going to be like every team will have a different way of doing it. And it could be comedic, uh, but I, I don't think you want your main event to be comedic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that was just kind of your point. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Patrick, so much for, for volunteering no your worries. time, being so generous with it. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us again. And I hope everyone enjoyed our convo. We'll definitely be doing this again. If we can nail you down, we got to do the American podcast. We got to do why is Bahrain, why are their bikes so slow? What's going on over there? So <laughs> I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation yeah. and talk to you soon.